Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in to Making Black Lives Matter from the streets to the classroom. My name is Brian Jones. I'm the Associate Director of Education at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. And I'm so thrilled to welcome you and to moderate this discussion. All of our speakers tonight are, or today, this afternoon, are contributors to this new book, Black Lives Matter at School and Uprising for Educational Justice, published by Haymarket Books. And all are activists and leaders in this effort to apply the energy and ideas from the Black Lives Matter movement to school. And whether you've been in this movement for the longest or you're new to thinking about this, we hope there'll be some strategies, some inspiration, and some new perspectives to take with you. We're gonna talk for about an hour on three different topics. We're gonna talk about ancestors. We're gonna talk about movement victories. And we're gonna talk about abolition. And then we'll have some time for you to ask questions of our very special guests. So get ready. Opal Tometi is an award-winning human rights defender and one of the three women co-founders of the hashtag Black Lives Matter. She's the founder of the new media and advocacy hub, Diaspora Rising. Denisha Jones is a member of the National Black Lives Matter at School Steering Committee and director of the Art of Teaching Graduate Teacher Education Program at Sarah Lawrence College. And she's the co-editor of Black Lives Matter at School. Jesse Hagopian is a member of the National Black Lives Matter at School Steering Committee also, and teaches ethnic studies at Seattle's Garfield High School. And he's also co-editor of Black Lives Matter at School. And lastly, but certainly not least, I'm so excited that we have Marche Doss with us, a recent graduate from Dorsey High School in South Los Angeles. Marche is an organizer and leader in the student-led movement called Students Deserve, and a contributor to the book, Black Lives Matter at School. Hello, and thank you all for taking the time to be here together. Thank you, Brian. Opal. I know you're on a tight schedule, so let me start with you. You wrote the foreword to this book. Can you share an excerpt? Absolutely, and, and let me just say it's such an honor, one, to be part of this amazing project, but to also just be here as part of this broadcast and to be able to share during this very important, um, and even I'd say you know historic week with everything that you all are up to in the world. So thanks so much for having me. Um, I'll go ahead and share this. Brief excerpt. As I write the forward for this important and necessary book, I can't help but feel intimately committed to this project's central thesis. The issues this book grapples with are personal for me. They were the very concerns that led me, along with Alicia and Garza and Patrice Kahn Cullors, to found Black Lives Matter. As an educator, I've walked the halls of many campuses and I've heard the concerns of students, parents, and teachers. And it feels like just yesterday that I too was a young person in school. The classrooms was a site of my own formative understanding of my own value in the world and my sense of what was possible for me, a person of color. In fact, it was in school when I first became aware that some people took issues with my skin color. I was in the first grade of my school in suburban Arizona, and recess had just ended. Our teacher called our class to come inside, and some friends and I were scurrying to join the line of 20 or so first graders. I stumbled over a friend and accidentally kicked a boy's shoe. He looked at me and sneered, nigger. I've never heard the word before, nor did I have a clue what it meant. However, young Opal knew from his tone and stare that the word wasn't anything good. And in my bewilderment, mixed with shame at my failure to understand his outrage and why he used this unique name for me and not the other girls, I knew intuitively I couldn't share what had happened with me with my teacher. <clears throat> Thankfully, my parents overheard me telling my younger brother about the incident and they took a stand for me. The very next day, they went to my classroom to discuss the episode with my teacher. While I never again heard that terrible word spoken in my class, 
I went on to have many other encounters over the years that left me feeling devalued and out of place. Still, it was that formative experience in the first grade that helped me see that if we, were ex if we experience or witness injustice, we can speak up and change it. It was in high school that I began to find my own unique voice. I joined a diversity and equality club and quickly assumed leadership. Uh, excuse me, assumed a leadership position as my passion and leadership skills became apparent. I was invited by our school principal to join the district-wide diversity council at age 16. I was the only black person in that entire space, but I was emboldened by the acknowledgement of my voice and my presence. At school, I worked to create programs, events, and opportunities for students of color that would reflect their beauty and ingenuity. I supported their visibility on campus by helping to usher in Diversity Week at my school. Uh, skip over a little bit more and just read one last little piece. School is the place where this growth can happen or devastatingly fail to happen. It's the place where students of color can be empowered or left to struggle. When we look at the wide swath of research, the anecdotal evidence and the rousing stories, it's abundantly clear that we must work to ensure that black students' lives matter. And this work needs to happen in educational settings because when we create safe and affirming environments for young black students, everyone benefits from the uplift. Mm. Uh, thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. Um, I failed to say that for the uninitiated that this book that you just read this excerpt from, Black Lives Matter at School, is taking its name from a movement, from the Black Lives Matter at School movement. And so for the really uninitiated, you know, please do at some point, not now, but later, go to blacklivesmatteratschool.com to learn more about this movement. And we're going to talk in a moment about some of the victories uh, that this movement can claim uh, in this year. It's really amazing, Opal, to just stay with you for a moment to think about the slogan, Black Lives Matter. Like that was 2013. It's remarkable that that slogan endures the way that it does. Uh, can you reflect on the journey that you've been on from 2013 to today with that slogan, with that movement? Absolutely. Well, I'm glad you you kind of shared it in a in a way that about frame the question in a way that really resonates with me, um, because you you said slogan right, and I know you you also mean that as a movement, but I feel it's important for us to to dig into that point because those three words, in many ways, have ushered in a type of conversation, mm -hmm. a kind of you know reorientation of the world of our understanding of what's possible. And it's become, you know, deeper than just a slogan, right? It's helped to catalyze um, a movement. It's helped to, to almost uh, animate, in a way, a set of ideology, I, sorry, ideologies, a set of ideas and a value system that says the antidote to white supremacy is actually Black Lives Matter, right? It's, it's, this is what we need. So let me, you know, go back in time to 2013, because um, some folks might not know, that, but that is when Black Lives Matter it originally came into being. Um, BLM started right after we found out that George Zimmerman was being acquitted for the murder of Trayvon Martin. Right? And, and, like We're talking about Black young people, Black students. I think so often about young teenage or Trayvon Martin who was stalked and killed in his own community. And for many of us who might have heard of the story originally, we were appalled, we were saddened, we were disturbed, and we were even more so outraged when George Zimmerman was acquitted for this murder. We all knew he did it. There was no, you know, changing the story. No, we all we we all heard the evidence, and the way the court case played out felt as though Trayvon was on his on trial for his own murder which is a very disturbing and deeply um, just unsettling thing to have occurred and to occur on a national stage, right? And on an international stage even, because so many people around the world also saw it. 
And it moved me to action. You know, I had a young brother, I have two younger brothers, but one who was 14 years old at that time. And I was thinking about him explicitly and how he was going to hear about this court case and how it unfolded and what he was going to think about his life and his possibility. Um, and I know that many other people were doing the same. And so just like so many of us, I went to social media and, and connected with a bunch of people who were also sharing their concerns and specifically seeing the love note from Alicia Garza that read, you know, something like, you know, black people, I love us, our lives matter. And then Patrice going on and putting on a hashtag on the Facebook post, which wasn't really the usual thing you did on Facebook those days, but she did it anyways. And then I saw it and said, hey, you know what? I don't know what this is, but I want to go buy the domain name and I want to I want to create a fan page and some other things and invite other black organizers to, to join. So for us, it was about reframing the discourse and actually not even just reframing the discourse, but having a type of discourse that didn't exist at that time. We needed to talk about anti-black racism explicitly. Mm -hmm. uh, it just wasn't what was happening. There was a lot of silence around race. And, and specifically silence around racism and its impact. And not only that, we weren't having a conversation that was systemic, right? There was a lot of individual this, individual that, that, you know, bad police officer there, that, you know, vigilante there. But what was clear was that there is a system that is behind all of this, that undergirds all of these instances. Um, these things aren't just happening, and these tragedies aren't just happening um, by happenstance. Mm -hmm. There is a system that allows the injustice to continue. And so we knew we needed to have a different type of conversation. And that's why, you know, we created Black Lives Matter, you know, way back when. And, you know, fast forward to today where, you know, BLM is known around the world, is being celebrated around the world. And because of the uprisings of 2020, um, has really been heralded as the largest social movement in history, which is beautiful and, and necessary. Mm -hmm. And it's absolutely necessary because uh, white supremacy, you know, anti-black race, anti-black logic has been the status quo, not only of the United States, but of the, the world, you know? Um, it's the way that you know, countries, nations, entire hemispheres orient to Africa, for example, or to communities around the Caribbean and so on. And so it's, it's a real, thing, right? It's a real, these are real issues. And we needed to have a different type of conversation um, in order for us to have a different set of actions, right? So the first kind of stage of, of BLM seems to have been an awareness raising. But then as people began to dig in deeper, they realized we were talking about action. <laughs> we we're talking about real systems change, you know, real shifting of power, um, giving us and, and having the ability to live dignified lives, have the ability to be respected, um, we deserve to thrive. So that's a, that's a little bit of my response to your yes. <laughs> I'm looking at the time. I know I don't, I don't want to go over, but I, I really want right. to have more of this conversation. Right, right. Well, I want to squeeze in as, as much of you into this conversation as we possibly can while we have you. Thank you for um, tracing that history for us and that continuity, your presence here is, is part of that continuity between what these organizers here are trying to do in schools and the larger BLM movement. And I want to ask now about, and, and we'll start with you, Opal, but this is a question for everybody, uh, about the deeper continuity of Black freedom struggles, uh, about the longer period of time um, that we look to. And I just want to know on a kind of personal level, however you want to take the question, what are the movement ancestors who in this moment you feel that you're calling upon? Who are you thinking about uh, and drawing inspiration from, um, if you want to take it that way, in this moment right now? And it could be anybody in, in history, any movement or organization or individuals, uh, but who are movement ancestors that you're calling on right now? Let's start with you, Opal. Okay, I love this question. I'm going to answer it, but I want to just say one more thing, actually, to speak to our our our, la our the previous question, um, because I think I'd be remiss if I didn't say that one of the things that I appreciate so much about what 
BLM has done and what and the ways in which communities have responded to Black Lives Matter and individuals have responded to Black Lives Matter is by understanding that it's not just about police brutality or one kind of issue in our society, but people have made the connections around what it could look like to ensure that Black Lives Matter in every sphere of our lives, in every institution, in every sector. And so really Black Lives Matter in school is really a testament to that, right? Because there's oftentimes this idea that the advocates will do that over there. <laughs> Those people do it over there. And so it's very easy for uh, there to be a lack of you know, responsibility or accountability around you know, certain issues. But the fact is that this isn't just a single issue <laughs> challenge, right? Okay. Racism impacts everything. It impacts literally everything. And so we can't be naive. And so what I'm so glad for is that people all across the world have begun to recognize the way in the way in which racism creeps up and hampers the quality of life of black people and so i'm just so moved and grateful that people have have begun um, to really take ownership and really step up in their own leadership and have made sense of what blm could look like in their respective industry right. you know workplace and beyond. So I'll just say that. And let me go on to your question because you know, we are in Black History Month. And so I think it actually is, is really fitting that you ask this question about our ancestors. And to be quite honest, there are so many people that I could look to and, and share about um, that, I, that I really revere. But in this moment, I got to be honest, I'm just thinking about my, my own lineage. I'm thinking about my, you know, my grandmother, I'm thinking about my own mom and just the amount of not only just like sacrifice, a lot of times we talk about sacrifice, but I think about my mom and the example that she has been to me and continues to be to me, you know, young black immigrant woman in Phoenix, Arizona. We were very poor growing up. Um, you know, really struggled in a number of ways Then you know, she experienced so much racism, just, gosh, back in the 80s and so on. But despite it all, was still very much so grounded in her own sense of who she was and her own culture. She would still wear the Nigerian, you know, dresses and head wraps. And that was our formal wear. And so seeing her just be true to who she was, um, despite being in you know white suburbia and all of that, was such um, was so defining for me, because I was able to see you know a black woman just stand in her dignity, uh, define herself on her own terms, express herself despite what everyone else looked like, and. I don't know how she did it, but she did it, and I'm glad that she did. And not only did she show up in her own, you know, the fullness of herself, she always shared with me about what she was doing to make her home both the community, right, our neighborhood and our, you know, our friends and family who were struggling from, if it was immigration issues to housing issues and, and being passed over for jobs, struggling with that but was also supporting our community back in Nigeria. She was supporting her own, you know, her own family, but also, you know, the, the community uh, organizations and, and groups and things like that. And so, um, so much of who I am is just by virtue of the lives that my folks lived and specifically my mom, but also how simply they translated um, their care and their concern. They never saw themselves as, you know, political or anything like that, but they just, were they just cared and they lived a very big life um with a very expansive view of who black people were and just a sense of pride in who we are too so my my own immediate ancestors <laughs> <laughs> right on. that's a great answer thank you so much opal thanks for joining us i know you might you probably have to dip out right about now but hang on as long as you can and um thanks again for coming and being a part of this book and for adding your voice to this conversation today uh, so let me throw it now to Jesse. Uh, what ancestors are you calling on in this moment? Thank you so much, Brian and, and Opal. Uh, I'm already inspired by this panel so far. And I think a lot of my inspiration comes from the long black 
freedom struggle and specifically the struggle for education. And I've learned so much about that struggle from you, Brian, from your writings and, and several uh, books, including Black Lives Matter at School. And, you know, I'm also inspired by everyone on this panel that's here today building this struggle. And I thank you all so much, you know, Denisha, thank you so much for pulling this book together and bringing me into the project, you know, and, and Marche, I can't thank you enough for the student activism you've done and, and Opal for giving us the language and the vision for how to fight back. Uh, I'm inspired by you all, but I, I, I want to just call on, uh, the name of Septima Clark, because she is somebody who I think is my inspiration for being an educator, a black woman who was the daughter of a laundry woman and a former enslaved person. And she became a teacher and taught in the public schools for some 40 years while also taking up the struggle for, for civil and human rights. And she participated in a class action lawsuit filed by the NAACP that led to pay equity for black and white teachers in South Carolina, right? And she paid a cost for that activism because in 1956, South Carolina passed a statute that prohibited city and state employees from belonging to civil rights organizations. So after 40 years of teaching, Septi McClark had to choose between continuing her career or uh, having to uh, abandon the NAACP. And she chose to stick with the movement and she refused to to leave her civil rights activity and and she was fired for that, right? And she took up a job with the Highlander Folk School uh, that developed a radical pedagogy that helped to train countless movement activists. And in fact, Rosa Parks came and learned from Septima Clark and the Highlander Folk School uh, just months before she helped to transform the world with her historic uh, stand by refusing to stand on that bus. And so I think that uh, Septima Clark is an example of the kind of educator that we need more of in this world. And I'll just end by saying that um, a famous quote from her, she said, I believe in I believe unconditionally in the ability of people to respond when they are told the truth. We need to be taught to study rather than to believe, to inquire rather than to affirm. Mm. And that's what drives my my uh, teaching and and as well as my own dad, who was in the struggle for ethnic studies and black studies in the late 60s. Fabulous. What about you, Denisha? What ancestors are you thinking about in this moment? Thank you so much. I knew Jesse was going to go with Septima, and it was so great to hear Opal talk about her family. And I'm, you know, I'm torn. There's so many people I want to name, right? People like Audrey Lord, um, James Baldwin. Um, there's just so many, right? But I think I really want to focus on, and I can't give a really good history of this person, but I want to tell you a little bit about who she was and all the other people I think like her ancestors that aren't going to get the recognition, right? So when I was in undergrad at the University of the District of Columbia, I had a professor in my teacher ed program named Dr. Irma Redfern Moore. And she was just your like traditional black woman, educator, no nonsense, but very caring, right? I was just, look, I was just trying to get an associate's degree. I wanted to open up a daycare. I really wasn't even seeing myself as a scholar. I didn't want to be in college too long. I need to make money. And she was like, that's all nice and well. You're going to get your bachelor's degree and you're going to teach because you have what it takes, right? And she saw that even when I couldn't. And she saw that in a lot of us. A lot of us who graduated when Dr. Redford Moore worked there, you know, she kept us going. She was committed to the field and to really prepare pairing black teachers and um, she passed away since I graduated in 2003 and you know her story will never be known right because she's just one of the many black educators and teacher educators who do this work every day and so I want to I, I want to 
really lift them up. All of the, the teachers who were teaching um, in our segregated schools, which we thought were so bad, but actually had some of the best teachers we will ever know, right? And so they did this work day in and day out in the one-room schoolhouses without the resources and without the pay of their white counterparts, but they really uplifted a Black people in Black community. And, and there's so many of them across, across the country, right, who've done this work and continue to do this work. And, you know, I think it's great to remember the ones um, that, that left us literary, you know, documents to kind of think about, but also the ones whose names are gone, right, unless those of us who learned under them remember them. So I hope um, some of my UDC colleagues remember Dr. Irma Redford Moore because she was definitely an ancestor. And I wish she was here now um, to have these conversations about Black Lives Matter in school and, and what does it mean for, for our students. I think she would be, be thrilled by all of this work. Thank you. And what about you, Marche? What ancestors are you thinking about in this moment? Um, I just want to start by saying is organizers, we are so like-minded and we think so much alike because I also thought myself of an ancestor in my own line. Her name is Phyllis Bird. She didn't do well, to the average person, she didn't do anything spectacular. Um, she was just a woman who got captured in Africa and mm -hmm. put on a slave ship and brought here to the Americas. But to me, she is this powerful, resilient person that started our history in America. Mm. You know, um, she was able to go through all of that. She endured all that pain, all that drama, and was still able to come here and, I mean, make this family and this line. And I'm, like, super happy and, like, thankful that she even did that. And I think that's just some extraordinary work that a lot of people don't talk about. Just... Mm -hmm our ancestors who actually were able to travel and endure that pain, just ordinary people. And to that point, I want to go in and say another movement that inspired me that happened in history was the Children's Crusade. Yeah. Regular, average Black children being extraordinary, going through these traumas, being packed in these cells that could only fit, like, eight adults, but it was, like, 55 children in one cell, like... Black people are so amazing. And so I get my inspiration from ordinary people because they're always like, how do you speak in front of these people? Or how do you, like, how can you learn? And how can you do this? And how do you know so much? But like the average person holds so much power and you can see that throughout history of people overlooking them. But yeah. Thank you so much. That's such a great answer. And such a great segue to the next thing I wanted to talk about, which to my mind is some of the victories that this movement has accomplished to unleash that potential and that energy of ordinary people. You know, the Black Lives Matter at School movement is a grassroots movement. It doesn't have any official sponsors or funding. Um, it's parents, teachers, and educators uh, and students uh, all over the country who are trying to lift up and affirm black students and black studies and trying to dethrone white supremacy in our schools in various manifestations. And it feels like we've been winning. Um, maybe not everything that we want, but it feels like we've made some progress, at least in the last year. Um, Denisha, can you report on the growth of this movement? Absolutely. Um, and we have made some some wins, right? Today, um, the second largest uh, teachers union, American Federation of Teachers, endorsed the Week of Action for the first time in uh, four years since we've been doing this movement. So that is great news, right? It, it's really helpful for teachers in who work under the US, AFT to have that endorsement. So when they get pushback from parents and from community members and police unions, right? They have the support of their teachers union who has fully endorsed this movement. So we are excited that um, our colleagues are, are getting that kind of support. Um, 
But overall, I think we've seen the movement just grow in, in so many schools across the country. Um, I We did a, a clubhouse discussion the other day, and there were teachers from Long Island. And I was like, I didn't know any teachers from Long Island were doing this, because I've been organizing with New York City for two years now, right? And she goes, well, we want to. We just don't know how. And now that they have protection of their union, they're going to do it. So we've seen, if you look at the map, right, if you go to NEA at Justice and look up the map that they've um, created to pinpoint, there are more events on that map this year than there was last year, and, then, and they're in different places, right? We're seeing growth in the South, which we've been calling for every time we have a national meeting. If you live in the Southern United States and you want to do this work, please let us know so we can get you on the map and people know they're not alone. Um, and so we see that, and we just see a lot more organizations reaching out to us and wanting to get involved and wanting to be a part of it, which is, I think, part of the work. And, and the fact that we, as the National Steering Committee, uh, pushed forward for this year of purpose. We're really seeing that rec um, resonate with people as well, too. We never wanted this to just be one week, right? But we wanted to highlight all of this work in a week. But we see a lot more people engaging with this idea of a year of purpose and how can they push their principals and their schools to take this on. So yeah, everybody's reporting about it because it's Black History Month. But what about March, right? Can you can, When we talk about Black Lives Matter at school at March and April and May and June, and, right, and we have a, a template for doing that, and we have different events that we're going to bring. And so I think that's helping grow the movement as well, too, you know, and, and so it's just been, it's been really humbling to see so many people reaching out, former students of mine. I got an email today from a former student, and I don't know if you remember me, but I, you know, I've been sharing your videos, the one you did with Jesse and Brian. I made my principal watch it because he thinks he knows what he's doing, but he doesn't. And then he heard you guys talk about it. And I said, and it like all made sense for him in that moment. So thank you. And I'm like, wow, like, you know, students that are not mine, but I work at Sarah Lawrence one of the alumni reached out and heard that I was there and I'm doing this work and she's so moved and I didn't even get to know her. I mean, it's so many stories like that that we're seeing. And I think really it's the youth, right? We're seeing more and more youth step up and wanting to be a part of this youth. I can speak this movement. I can speak from New York City, right? But our Integrate NYC youth, Teens Take Charge, Students Break the Silence, right? They're, they're taking control of this movement and they're, they're connecting it to the other work they're doing, right? They're connecting Black Lives Matter at school to end the gifted and talented program and the exclusionary placement test in New York City, right? They're seeing a link between that work. Students Break the Silence is pushing for police-free schools and connecting it to Black Lives matter at school. So I think that is really showing the growth of this, right? We had a whole conversation yesterday about police-free schools, but we also talked about ethnic studies, right? And hiring more Black teachers and how it's all connected in the movement. So um, it, I think we're just going to continue to see people really understand that this is not just a day to wear a t-shirt. It's not just a week of action, right? It's a way of life. It's a way of really taking back our schools and, and really making them a place where, where Black brilliance is the norm. Thank you. And, you know, before I ask a similar question to Jesse, maybe this is a good moment to hear some of Marche, some of your story, Marche, um, speaking of the leadership of young people um, fighting for Black Lives to Matter in school. So you've been part of a series of victories at your high school in Los Angeles. Can you tell us, Marche, how you got started in this movement and how the movement grew? Yeah, um, I said this so many times, <laughs> it's, it's so crazy. Um, literally, I was in my history class, my history teacher actually recruited me, they invited me to a meeting, which is why like student teacher connections are like really important. Because without us having that connection, I wouldn't have been able to get involved in this work because that person introduced me to it so um I went to a meeting and I learned some facts um about our school system and I didn't like it and I couldn't believe it and then I started putting those facts that we were learning about into my own life and seeing how I had been affected by that and then it really made me mad <laughs> because like <laughs> This whole time, I'm like, well, this is just how it is, you know? Like, that's how you always think it is until you realize, like, it's not. Like, there's someone over here living their life, going to school, not being, like, watched with four cops, not having a police station on their campus, just, like, being able to go to school to learn to be, like, relaxed and not worrisome. 
and then I'm like the complete opposite. And there's nothing that's different besides the, you know, the income and the color of my skin. So when I really started figuring that out, I got involved and I was able to become a leader in Students Deserve. And um, together, we, a bunch of students from different schools, at the time I went to Dorsey, so we got to get connected with schools around in our areas like Hamilton, like LA High. Um, We just, we, we built a relationship with all of them and we would come together and we would meet and we would plan out actions and events where we would go to the school board and we would repeatedly tell them about our experiences with being randomly searched and what we wanted to happen instead. And we wanted to end it. Um, and we wanted them to invest in students, invest in community schools, invest in PSWs instead and use that money because at the time before we had won, they were spending $1 million every you know school year to fund random searches. And they weren't even effective. They were counterproductive. They broke relationships with staff and students and teachers. We did not feel safe or comfortable. So even if there was an issue, there wouldn't be that relationship for me to come tell you. And um, it took money away from us. It took away from funding that we already barely had. So um, it was a terrible investment on Mm -hmm. LAUSD's behalf. And we organized. We went to the school board's house. We actually crashed um, one of his fundraisers where someone donated Uh, money for us to get into there where he wanted to talk about the future of public education that didn't include any voices of parents students or community members which was very odd Mm. and he just had so much money to waste you guys his tables were separated by like jewels like they were like oh you sit in the ruby section and you're over here with the emeralds and it was really fancy and it had cushion on the walls anyway There's a video on Students Deserve's um, YouTube channel, but we were able to go in there and interrupt that. And we got on camera of him running away from his responsibilities, running away from the fact that he knows that he's spending $1 million to invest into these random searches that are not effective at all. And we used that momentum and we kept doing actions like that. And we went to the school board and we got them to vote four votes on ending random searches. And then that's how we were able to achieve that victory. Wow. That's impressive. But you didn't stop there, did you? There's there's um, there's a little bit more to your story. What came next? Um, yeah. So uh, after we finished random searches, so let me start by saying Students Deserve isn't all about ending random searches. Students Deserve is about making Black Lives Matter in schools. And we do that with students, parents, and community members right from the grassroots. We make those relationships and we build those relationships and we invite these people into our communities, people who are constantly overlooked or when they don't put in enough effort to get Black parents involved, we do that. We build those relationships. And so with that being said, we build these relationships so that we can get funding and resources and break down these systems and barriers that um, have been put placed on us in our schools and in our communities. And we use that effort and that strength um, <clears throat> to do that. And so that's how all these victories you know, have been won. And so a part of ending the school to prison pipeline comes more policies. And that policy happened to be pepper spraying. And we found out that they had been pepper spraying countless schools um, due to like minor issues, like a school fight will break out. And then they'll pepper spray um, at one school at Fremont. They actually called SWAT team and literally, I believe it was last year, barricaded the school with all the SWAT team Like, that's a waste of money and resources. Like, you had better things to do with your time. But anyway, that's what happened. And everyone was able to see that, yet it it wasn't being reported on. And that was happening at multiple of our schools, multiple of our predominantly Black schools. Right. Um, So we seen that, and we called the district out on that. And we 
we were able to mobilize and organize our parents and our teachers and our community members and our other organizations who also have the same common goal, which is to fund our public schools and give Black students um, the things that they need to succeed. And um, yeah, we were able to do that and we also got them to vote. We had other key you know, points that happened in th that story, but those are boring. We want to stay to all the exciting stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. That's awesome. That's that's fabulous. Um, so, Jesse, I'm curious to hear about your perspective. You're in Seattle, where this all began in one elementary school, and now here it is blowing up as this nationwide movement. Can you just talk about your experience of the growth of this movement and how you see it now. Yeah, it really is breathtaking to go back in my memory and, and think about the the pain and just the low moment that we felt when John Muir Elementary School received a bomb threat because the educators there wanted to wear shirts that said Black Lives Matter and hold an event to celebrate their black youth. And the incredible educators there like Deshaun Jackson, who helped to organize that event and Julie Trout, who made that shirt, uh, you know, we're, we're hurting from that attack. And the school district canceled the event and they brought in bomb sniffing dogs. Uh, and, you know, we were able to help support them and bring a resolution to our union calling for October 19th of 2016 to be Black Lives Matter at school day. And, you know, we got some 3,000 educators to go to school wearing the shirts that day in solidarity with John Muir and teaching about the black freedom struggle that day. And that eruption of solidarity inspired the educators in Philadelphia who transformed what we had done and took it to the next level by turning it into a week of action and breaking down the 13 principles of the Black Lives Matter Global Network uh, into teaching points for each day of the week, thanks to the inspiration by Tamara Anderson uh, there in Philly. And, and to think about that first year and then how it became a national week of action the following year. And this is our fourth national week of action. And as Denisha said, the explosion of this movement is incredible. I think when you go and look at the map on the NEA website, we have probably increased the amount of cities and towns participating in this by threefold this year. I think we had 30 uh, last year, somewhere around there checking in. We now have uh, an international movement. There's a couple of cities in Canada who have registered now as participating in Black Lives Matter at school week. The DC public schools officially uh, endorsed the action uh, this year. And, it, and it's really incredible to see <clears throat> this work deepen, and it has to because we're in a polarized society. And so even as we're growing, the other side is fearful that we might actually make Black Lives Matter in school. And so Fox News ran a hit piece on the movement. And, you know, many of us received uh, really threatening emails uh, over the last uh, day because of that attack. But, uh, you know, as scary as that is, in reality, it's a sign that our movement is making a difference. You know, we chased the police out of the Minneapolis public schools, thanks to the leadership of the students there. Uh, police were chased out of the St. Paul public schools and the Oakland public schools and the Denver public schools and the Charlottesville public schools. And I'm proud to say here in Seattle, thanks to incredible organizing by youth activists like Angelina and Kittis, uh, who put together a petition that got 14,000 signatures in just a couple days, the police have been removed from the Seattle public schools as well, right? Yeah. And when you think about how we added that fourth demand of fund counselors, not cops, um, at, at the... Uh, inspiration from Dignity in Schools and the great work that that uh, the Advancement Project has done in, in, in organizing for police-free schools. You know, uh, we were so glad to be able to join them in that call. And now to see those victories occurring across the country mm -hmm. is it, really incredible. Yeah, that is incredible. Um, and 
I think that's a good segue to the last thing I want to ask about, which is abolition. But before I do, I just want to remind people watching that we're getting close to the time when we're going to read out some questions from the chat. So please, now is a good time to throw some questions in there and we'll get to as many as we can. So uh, Denisha, I'm wondering if you could tell a little bit the story of the way that this, that third, that sorry, that fourth demand got put in there about fund counselors, not cops. And to talk a little bit about police in schools, because I think for some people, uh, this might be one of the most challenging or thorny elements of this movement. It's one thing to uh, say we're going to teach black history and affirm black students. But then when you say, well, wait a minute, we're going to um, uh, we're going to we're going to shift funding away from police in schools um, towards counselors in schools. Uh, that seems to be going deeper um, and maybe going farther than people in the past have been willing to go. Uh, so, Denisha, can you tell the story about how that fourth demand came about and kind of where you see this movement going? Yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, and to Jesse's point, so it, it was based on the work of Dignity in Schools and Advancement Project, but it was also a, like I like to call a loving call out, right? <laughs> Not a call, a call in, a loving call in, right? We we did receive some 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 people asking us why aren't we addressing the issue of police brutality in schools? And you know, when you're doing this movement and and you're doing it as a volunteer effort and no one's getting paid, and someone's like, why aren't you doing this? You have to like, well, we can't do everything, right? But we actually stepped back and thought about. You know, and, and I owe this to um, one of our steering committees, Okaikor, um, because she's much better at this, right? She's very much about embodying the principles of Black feminist organizing, right? A Black feminist queer organizing. So where I might have been offended by the loving call in to do more because we're already doing so much, she actually engaged us to really think about what they're asking us. They're asking us to make sure that we are more than just a week of wearing a t-shirt, that we are actually looking at the issues, right, that are impacting black children and we were i mean we all agreed right but we just hadn't thought about that demand and so we received that response we we, we talked about it and immediately we knew that this would be a problem we knew the connection the closeness between police and teachers i don't know the numbers but i want to say somewhere between like 40 to 60 percent of teachers are married to police a lot especially in cities like new york and philadelphia right and so we knew that the minute we made this demand it was going to ratchet up the the um the attacks in, in a way that we hadn't seen before so we went back and forth we had long conversations at the steering committee to really think about it and at the end we said they're going to hate us no matter what they hate us for saying black lives matter at school you know, we're not asking for anything. Look, I, I, this was before. Back then, I was like, look, I didn't believe in a police-free world. I'm like, police have their role, right? Just not in our schools, right? If you think about it, if your job is to look for criminals and to catch criminals and to, to, to punish criminals, you can't put that person in an environment where children are at because then children become criminals, right? They're, that's their job. And I think a lot of cops, some of the good cops will tell you this. I Don't put me in a school because that's not where I'm trained and what I'm supposed to be doing, right? But, you know, they're, they need the funding and school budgets are an easy way to make money for police. So they've kind of merged. But I think, you know, we have to just step back and think what's best for children. You know, now I am in more of a police-free world, right? We don't need police if we take care of our community. If we take care of poverty and homelessness and houselessness and, and lack of health care and, and mental health issues, right, that we don't need to be policed by a, a police force, right? We might actually just need investigators who investigate crime. <laughs> That's very different. Those are two very different things, right? And I, and I went to law school, right? So I understand how the law functions, right, in that sense, that it's not about a justice system right now. It's a criminal system. It's a criminal code, right? And people are just following the code and the law, and there's not really care for the people involved, right? And so when you're thinking about children, I, look, we all have the right to protect children from police. Like that's just, there's just to me, there's just no other way to put it. Like we can't have an environment where police are there to look at children as criminals, right? Because then we see a fight and it turns into a criminal act when actually it's usually a response to trauma. And it can be solved with people who know how to go in and help someone who's having a crisis moment in trauma and is using violence and anger. And so, you know, I, I appreciate the loving call in that we got. We adopted the man and we continue to receive immense pushback. You know, right now, now that UFT is endorsed, people are running to our website. 
they see a quote from my Fata Shakur, right? The, the chant. And they're emailing us about she was a horrible cop killer, right? This is the same kind of language. And, and you know, we're just, look, we're not even going to engage because we don't see the point in this and going back and forth, right? But it's going to continue to go. We saw last year Boston Teachers Union attacked by the Boston Police Union when they came out for the Black Lives Matter Week of Action. And so, again, we're saying counselors. Counselors belong in our schools, right? Fun counselors, not cops. We don't need cops in our schools if we have psychologists, social workers, mental health therapists, acupuncturists, everything. We need all of the mental health people in our schools. And, and that's what it's about. And, and so we wish that the, you know, the police would consider that. What is your role in society? And is your role really around children? And are you, are you helping children in that role um, so that we can come to some understanding? But I, I don't expect that to happen anytime soon. So we're just going to keep doing what we're, what we're doing, which is saying our kids deserve better than police. Right. Marche, how does you, how do you and or your movement see this question of police in schools? You've been up against random searches, you've been up against pepper spray, but what about the police, their presence in the schools? Right. I should not be <clears throat> I should not be this excited to tell you guys about this, but <clears throat> actually I should be because it's a huge victory for us. But here in LA, students deserve use their powerful people organizing and came together and built a coalition with over seventy plus other organizations to put our you know, our community power together and push on LAUSD to defund school police. And we actually got them to defund $25 million from the school to police department. We're going for more. Obviously, that's not enough. Um, school police, they get paid about $80 million, maybe even a little bit more than that, um, which is way too much. Mu I'm sorry, way too much because... Um, that's like, like you said, they don't belong in schools. Police don't belong in schools. They weren't trained. They're not meant. They don't have that mentality. And um, to put them in a space with children, it makes you think about, like, how you view your students and what do you really think about their safety and their trauma. And especially for us when students have been actually going to the school board and telling you, like, hey, this happened to me, the school, poli school police officer was there, they did not help me, they did not benefit me, or maybe they are the ones who is who are causing me to have this reaction right now because something that happened outside of school with LAPD maybe because there's police brutality happening all the time and that ha that trauma happens in our communities and now you're bringing it or re-traumatizing us by bringing it onto campuses and that's obviously not the correct use of funding but what always baffles me is that black people and brown people and people are constantly telling that these government officials that hey this is not the solution this is not the way and they're just like, oh, well, we have to do more research on it or we don't have the funding and we can't help you. And that just constantly shows you where black students are on their priority list. Mm. And it's not number one like it should be. Mm. Thank you. And Jesse, where where are where where are your thoughts on on this? I know um, people have been bringing together the ideas of the abolitionist movement with the Black Lives Matter at School movement to think about themselves as abolitionist educators, um, thinking specifically about Bettina Love, uh, Bettina Love's work and, and her framing of abolitionist teaching. Um, so what do you think about the ways that teachers and parents and students are raising these questions about what abolition means in school? Yeah, I've been deeply inspired by Dr. Bettina Love and her framework of abolitionist teaching. Everyone should read her book, We Want to Do More Than Survive, uh, about abolitionist teaching. And, um, you know, I, on in June of this last year, uh, we passed several resolutions in the Educators Union here in Seattle 
Uh, we passed seven resolutions in solidarity with the movement for black lives, including to remove police from schools wow. and to remove them from the King County Labor Council. I think one of the first in the country where the police were kicked out of the Labor Council because they're not part of the House of Labor. In fact, when you look historically, they've been on the wrong side of every picket line, right? They're the ones who have been uh, breaking up the picket lines in the historic battles uh, of labor for, for better working conditions. And, and today, they're brutalizing black and brown communities and uh, don't deserve to be organizing with the rest I think, of of organized working people. And at that same union meeting, we passed my resolution to defund the Seattle Police Department by 50% and to reinvest that money in education and in healthcare and programs to support families as one step towards abolition, not, not uh, the, the final uh, action. And they did that for several reasons. I mean, of course, people were horrified by what happened to George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery and Tony McDade and too many people to name. But it wasn't just the folks outside of our city that inspired us to want to keep our kids safe uh, from the police. It was right here in Seattle where Charlena Lyles, a pregnant mother of three, was killed in front of her children in her own apartment by police officers. And those children went to the Seattle public schools and they had grieving teachers that had to figure out how to put the pieces back together and how to help uh, deliver trauma care for those youth. And we wanted to be part of the struggle uh, to keep our children safe. And you know, when we looked at the mismatch priorities of the Seattle uh, city budget, it was just outrageous to find out that the city spends over $400 million a year on the police, by far the largest part of their budget. And there's uh, amazing things like some $30 million in overtime pay for police. There's one officer, uh, Ron Willis, who met, he's a beat cop. OK, 50 year old beat cop in Seattle. He made four hundred and fourteen thousand dollars last year on six occasions. He was compensated for more than 24 hours in a single day. Right. This is what's happening with the, the priorities. And, you know, our movement here in Seattle, uh, Black Lives Matter at school is wants people to understand this basic truth that hurt people hurt people. Mm. And whole people heal people, right? And so massive wealth inequality and structural racism, I think, are hurting people in our city. And those constitute the biggest threat to public safety, right? We now have an opportunity to make the kind of social investments in housing and in education and health care that can create whole and thriving communities and, and get at the root causes of violence. And when we have those kind of thriving communities, we don't need police. They don't keep us safe. We know that the safest communities across the country are not the communities with the most police officers. <laughs> They're the communities with the most resources and wealth, right? And, you know, in my own high school, we have 150 homeless kids, okay? Mm -hmm. We're talking about a city with Microsoft and Amazon and Boeing and Starbucks and Bill Gates and, and Jeff Bezos, the wealthiest people the world has ever known. And yet we can have 150 homeless kids in my school. We can uh, have a situation where in the middle of a pandemic, we don't even have a nurse for every school every day, right? And so to me, public safety is about having every kid have a place to live and have food to eat and trauma counseling and, me and mentorship, not patrolling them, arresting them uh, and, and, and the rest of it. Wow. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I'm going to take some, I'm going to read out some questions from the, from the audience. Uh, and so if you're listening to this, by the way, keep them coming. We have a good amount of time. Um, we have one that reads like this. The rise of the far right and fascistic groups is a serious threat to BLM, the organized left and to democracy in general. What do the presenters think is the best way to fight this? Um, and I, I start with this one because you raised the question of um, the pushback that you've gotten in some places. And 
the way that some kind of right wing media outlets have have done hit pieces and pointed people in your direction. So what do you think about this, about how do we challenge these kind of far right groups? Well, I'll just start real quick by saying that when John Muir Elementary School wore T-shirts that said Black Lives Matter, the open white supremacists thought they had won when they made a bomb threat on that school and the school district officially canceled the event. And then come to find out instead of them winning, they sparked a national movement that now includes tens of thousands of youth. And so to me, the key is solidarity, right? It was the fact that other educators came to their aid and then parents and students joined in the movement. And so when we make those connections in our community, we far outnumber the organized white supremacists and we can chase them out uh, of our of our school systems and our society if if we link arms and struggle together. Marche and Denisa, do either of you want to jump in on that as well? Sure. I mean, I would just add that, you know, we have the 13 guiding principles for a reason. So I when I write a blog and an early childhood blog about Black Lives Matter at school, somebody always says, oh, that's a terrorist organization. So I list them, you know, tell me how is restorative justice and empathy and loving engagement and diversity and globalism? How is that terrorism? Right. I think we just need to remember that we you know, like Jesse said, Tamara Anderson and her colleagues in Philadelphia picked these statements because they wanted to ground us in something we could put forward for this movement, right? And so these are 13 principles that we we're teaching about, we want people to learn about because it does push back against fascist nonsense, right? And, and this idea that black history is only slavery and civil rights and freedom or that there's nothing else to, to black people, right? And so I think that's how we push back. We really stop teaching about black people pain, we think about black joy, and we use these guiding principles to lead the way. Thank you. Arshay, do you want to jump in too? Um, <clears throat> I would just say that I agree with both of you guys. Um, solidarity, positivity, those are all of the key things that I feel like you would need to push back against white supremacy white supremacist because they they feed off each other they feed off their negativity they feed off their own ego about you know they just feel so inferior i feel like towards black people and by not letting them win by coming into our own life by taking what is ours by learning and re-educating ourselves and our community members we are actively combating that Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have another question from Ryan who asks, how can I effectively help my young students understand BLM? And I, I guess I take this to mean, you know, young elementary school students. Uh, maybe, you know, in some phase, this was a strong movement in the high schools. But what about the early childhood folks? And, and I want to hear all of you say something, but I'm going to start with Denisha. And I just want to say, I, I think um, our friends at uh, the, Bank Street, the Bank Street School of Education actually right now are doing a Black Lives Matter at School Early Childhood Symposium. Uh, so don't leave this conversation and go there, but uh, you know you can view it after the fact. Um, but I think that's actually, it's it, it's not yet because I'm on that panel later oh, today. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> when we wrap up, we can head over to the Bank Street panel that starts okay. at five cool. thirty p.m. Eastern time. Um, I have to say something first because I am the resident early childhood expert, and I'm super excited. And that's one of the things that drew me to this work when we first got started. It feels like such, it was such a long time ago, but I was in D.C. and I remember thinking great, well, how are we going to make this work for young children? And um, Lelania Garcia, our kindergarten teacher, was on it before I was. The first thing she did was take the principles and write them in child-friendly language. And I remember reading that, and I was like, wow, New York City's on top of it. And I used, to, I used to speak her name before I knew her, and I was just like revered that she was doing all this amazing work. And you, you can't see it because of my background, but she has a book out her, um, um, called What We Believe, a Black Lives Matter Principles Activity Book published by Lee and Lowe. Um, and um, Lelania wrote the, um, the dialogue and the principles and the prompts for young 
young children and Karen Davidson does, does the artwork. So we've always believe that you bring this work to young children, right? And so we have the principles in child-friendly language. We have lessons for young children on the principles, how to talk about the demands. And I think what really moves me, and, and, and you should listen to Lelania speak about this because she teaches to our kindergarten students, is that when you what you realize with these principles is that it grounds you in how, the type of classroom you want to have with young children, right? Every, all of it. You want children to to be queer affirming and transgender affirming and to recognize what that means for for the world we live in, right? And and for Black villages and Black families. And so and it's so natural, you know, for them to get it and to talk about it. And so once she talks about the principles and then you read a story months later, the kids remember it and they go, oh, that's loving engagement, the way they were engaging with each other, or they were they didn't know how to affirm that transgender student. They're, they need the transgender affirming principle. So they, they get it at a young age. And it, it, I can't wait to see these kids grow up and see how natural this way of being is for them, right? Uh, last year, I went to uh, a, Maple, Maple Pe a Maple Street uh, preschool in Brooklyn for their Black Lives Matter rally. Um, and it's three and four-year-olds singing Black Lives Matter songs, um, doing chants, and it's moving and it's inspiring and, and it's young children and it's appropriate and it's love and they get it and, and, and they recognize it. And so I think that's where we have to really start. We need more of this in early childhood. So shout out to all my early childhood teachers who are teaching this all year long because this is gonna be how we really make a change. Thank you. And there's several, I should just point out, there's for early childhood educators, there's a whole section of contributions on early childhood work uh, in in the book. Uh, Jesse, what, do, what, do, what are your thoughts about this? Well, yesterday, as I was making my kids breakfast and they were logging on to their online class, uh, I had to just stop what I was doing, turn off the stove and come over because my student's teacher said, it's Black Lives Matter at school week. And I, I want you all to know that this is the most important subject in school. This is more important than anything else I'm going to teach you. And, you know, for his my, my second grade son's math teacher to say that just meant so much to me. It just melted my heart. And, you know, I, I think that uh, somebody somebody said that if white students are old enough to do racist acts, then black students uh, and all students really are old enough to learn about uh what racism is, and and I think I'm grateful for L uh, Lilinia and and Denisha and all the ch early childhood educators that are helping to bring this to my my own son and to so many parents, young students across the country. Fabulous, thank you, Marche. W how do you think about this? Whether it's dealing with uh, your own classmates and 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 your peers engagement or even younger students? Um, well, Brian, I've never organized younger students, any elementary students, but I have organized high schoolers. And um, the way that we got students involved and the way that we blanketed our school and we were able to pass out over 75,000 buttons whereby being relatable, which is like how we talked about earlier. You know, you don't know something until you don't know something. I didn't know how this thing <laughs> affected me until someone, you know, exactly like, you know, you start comparing it like, well, this is what you're saying this is, and this is my life, and applying it, and hey, like, these are all the ways that it affected me. And going to my classmates, like, hey, girl, hey, sis, what's up? Like, having that conversation on a peer level, it, it wasn't formal, it was camaraderie, it was genuine, and relating that to that, um, to what was going on and bringing them on and getting them involved. And that's really what was able to help us organize that, building those foundational relationships, which I hear everyone on this call talking about right now. <laughs> right, fabulous. Um, so we have a question that's about, we have a question that says, um, so much change hinges on mindset. Do you have any recommendations for NIMBY, which stands for not in my backyard folks who don't see the urgency of action? And I guess I'd like to broaden it to, uh, I was actually on a call right before this with a group of educators in Brooklyn 
um, who have, um, who have um, I think, almost no black students uh, in their population. So if why do people who, why are some schools without black students in them, why would Black Lives Matter at school week of action be a thing that makes sense? What's the urgency for people who are, I mean, it's one thing, for example, of course, we understand this is affirming and that's a really important intervention for black students. Uh, but what if there are no black students in the school? Uh, what is the urgency of this work in a school like that? Uh, let's start with you, Jesse. Sure. Well, I would say that so much of our school system today is about shame and fear for all students. It's about telling students that if you don't do your homework, you aren't going to graduate and then you won't get a job and then you'll be homeless. And it, it's driven by fear, right? And it's about shaming students around Oh, your test scores weren't high enough. And there's a specific way that that attack is levied against black students that feel that pressure most intensely, right? And that shame and that fear is really cultivated by attacking black students. But I think it, if we can uh, help to organize to stop the shame and fear and attack on black students, it will have a ripple effect in terms of transforming the entire public school system to make it more student-centered and less fear-based, right? Now, you know, I think that the corporate education reformers have really tried to snatch away the love of discovering something new, right? And replace it with standardized tests, metal detectors, zero tolerance discipline, police, uh, in our schools. And so much of our resources are going to things that are about punishing and degrading students. And if we were able to wrestle away the millions of dollars, the billions of dollars that we are wasting on high stakes standardized tests that are being used to rank and sort children and were originally created by eugenicists and white supremacists, right? And, and the money that's there to to police students and reinvest that in education, it would help all students, right? And so we're fighting for a school system and a world with black joy, with creativity, imagination, collaboration, and collective action. And I really think that uh, that's going to end up benefiting all students in, in the school system. What about you, Marche? Did your, um, do you have any experience or suggestions or thoughts in this? about this, about people who don't feel the urgency of this issue in their school? Yeah, um, so a lot of the times this is brought up in our work because now as we're, you know, calling for a defunding of school police right now, a lot of people are, we've actually had people like organize and come up to a student action and literally get their motorcycles and rev the engine so loud drowning out our voices when we we're saying that you know we're saying our testimonies and saying that our education matters and saying that our life matters and organizing these people um at the school board they come with their blue lives matters flags and their freaking police flags with the blue strip and the american flag and they rev their engines and they try to drown us out like i've literally had this happen and I'm going to say that's the prime example why this needs to happen even if you don't have any black students at your school it is important to follow like Anisha said these um, principles that are lined out for you because teaching someone empathy that like that doesn't do you any harm teaching someone how to love and care teaching someone how to respect another person even if they're different if, if their beliefs are different that is, that is how, that doesn't affect anybody. That is how we are going to change the world by teaching each other these principles and being able to, uh, you know, reciprocate it with one another instead of coming from a place of hate and fear. And, you know, when people don't know things, they're afraid of change and they don't understand it because they haven't been taught that way. But that straight that example from that action shows the ignorance that happened they don't understand what we're trying to tell them and um they weren't all white i'm gonna say that they weren't all white and it's just saying that 
these people, they don't, they can't grasp the concept that we're bringing forth to them about love and empathy because I feel personally they haven't experienced that yet. They mm-hmm. weren't able to have that capacity to understand that and whoever raised them and taught them hatred towards another person you know we raise people like that and so we're actively combating that so even if you don't have black students you're still affecting the world you're still affecting change by following this thank you denisha your thoughts on this Yeah, I mean, I I hear a lot of parents who are concerned about, you know, we're making white children feel guilty. And I say, you know, actually, if you don't give your child this this experience now, you're doing them a great disservice to how they're going to be able to relate, right, to the future of the world. Like Marche just said, do you want your child on on the other, on the wrong side of history forever? Because we didn't give them the tools to understand what we're talking about, about anti-Black racism, right? And I'm going to quote Lele Garcia again, oppression is bad for everyone. This is something you can say really easy with five-year-olds that they really understand, right? Oppression is bad for everyone. And, and white people don't spend enough time thinking about the psychological price they pay to think that they are superior under whiteness, right? The mediocrity that then follows, the self-doubt, the anger, right? They don't pay attention to that because they want to just act like it's not really impacting them. But even more than that, if we think about the future and what the world is going to need, right, in in a global world, we're going to need kids who can have conversations and and understand what anti-Black racism is, how to spot it, how to move past it, how to understand systems of oppression and how to push past that. And, and do you want your kid not at seat at that table because you didn't equip them because you left them thinking America is great and, and everything is perfect and we don't really need to address our history? I mean, that's a choice. I don't think parents want to make that choice for their child, right? But you do them a disservice by not letting them experience this, right? Not letting them have this conversation now and get comfortable. Another thing Lelania says, I should have her up here, right? Is we're all about five years old when it comes to talking about race, right? So we need to break that. People need to graduate high school and be able to have these conversations, right? It shouldn't take going to college to understand what institutional racism and systemic racism is, right? You should be like Marshall and and, um, Nathaniel and even younger having these conversations, right? Or the kids we heard at the New York City rally, right? You were there, the virtual rally, Brian, right? Those kids get this. You know, they were middle school and even younger, right? And so that's the kind of generation we want to leave for this country where they are going to really address racism and anti-Black racism in ways we could have never imagined because we're giving them the tools through their education to do so. Wow, that's such a such all fabulous answers. Thank you. I'm uh, I'm glad we got that question. I think we probably have time for one more. Um, so I'm gonna read out this question, and I guess I want you to kind of use this question also as an opportunity to offer any last thoughts, probably that we'll have. But this question gets at um, what you might think of as maybe a tension in the movement between people looking at their own classroom and their, maybe their own school community and say, okay, what are we gonna do differently or how are we gonna do things differently and on a pretty small scale where we have a lot of control over what happens and we, we're gonna change the curriculum or create conversations that we didn't do in the past. But this movement is also trying to make demands. There's four demands and those demands are about changes that need to happen on a bigger scale. Um, hiring black teachers and counselors, not cops, and mandating ethnic studies and ending zero tolerance, right? So there's a history of black educational activism really doing both, of taking charge of what's right in front of you and trying to do something different and push the envelope and making demands of the system to try to change the system on a bigger scale. But with that in mind, LS asks specifically a question. As a black educator, this is the question, I've heard and seen the ways that administration ignores and devalues black educators, staff, and students. In talking with other BIPOC staff at my school, there's a general sense of real and lived sentiments of feeling burnt out from trying and just seeing more harm rather than change. I would love some words, inspirations, and thoughts about how as educators we can make change within this large and harming system that is education. Uh, let's start with you, Marche. 
Um, I would say for motivation and encouragement, I would say to think about students. And I know that sounds very simple, but um, I feel like naturally as black people, we're exhausted because we're constantly fighting for our right to do something. It doesn't matter what it is. We're constantly fighting to be able to do something. So it's natural that we would feel exhausted but I know another thing that sometimes we have difficulty doing is leaning on each other mm -hmm. and knowing that if you cannot do something, someone else that is also in this work may have the capacity to do something and switching that role and building those relationships with your comrades, not just people who you want to come to an action, but people who you are actually side by side organizing with so like at your school you know there's um so for students deserve when we start a chapter at a school we gather together maybe one or two teachers who can be responsible or like open the space for the students maybe order a uh, lunch just help out where they can while students do all the other works and they'll switch off on those terms and we're able to like hey, um, can you come to my classroom and talk about this or help me with this and don't quite get this, but um, not just building these relationships with um, the people that we want to educate, but also with each other and building that trust so that we will be able to relieve some of the stress off ourselves. Thank you. Denisha, how about you? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I think first one, you got to, you know, you got to recognize that there is a lot of burnout in doing this work, right? It's, it's, it's taxing, right? So really, really think about what does it mean to engage in healthy self-care for yourself and how to step back and set boundaries. And, you know, I'm loving all the invites for the book, but I'm doing a hard pass come February 6th at the end of the week of action. If we are not planning an event, I am going to have to say no for so they catch my breath, right? But I, you know, Brian, you started this with the ancestors and I want to end by coming back to two ancestors. Um, in the book, Cecily Meyer Cruz, in her chapter, she ends with a quote from Frederick Douglass. Um, the struggle may be a moral one or it may be a physical one, but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without demand. And I think about, right, what Marche said, like we always feel like we have to be in struggle and we are, right? Because power concedes nothing without demand. We have four demands for a reason. It could just be about the principles, but that's not how you get through the struggle. And it's also a beautiful struggle. It really is one of the most beautiful struggles I have ever been a part of in my life. And I am grateful to be a part of it. Um, and the other quote that I want to share is from Audre Lorde. Right? And she taught us that the master's tools can never dismantle the master's house. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, schooling is the master's tool, right? It, it's, it's a way to reinforce um, the white supremacy, the patriarchy, the capitalism, right? But what we're doing in this movement in Black Lives Matter at school is we are creating different tools, right? We're creating education for liberation. And so we are dismantling the master's house and it's not gonna happen overnight and it probably won't happen in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. But as Bettina Love taught us in abolitionist teaching, abolitionists fought for a future they would never see. And we do this work for your future we may never see, but we know it'll come. It'll come for the next generation because we are doing the important work. So take a breath, <laughs> take some rest, but get up every day and know that we need you in this struggle. Wow, beautifully put, thank you. Uh, last word from you, Jesse. Yeah, no doubt. Thank you everyone for uh, this opportunity today. I've learned a lot from you all. And my thoughts on this final question, just do go back to the first question about uh, drawing inspiration from our ancestors. And, you know, knowing that our enslaved ancestors uh, snuck off of plantations when it was illegal to learn how to read and write and taught each other how to read and write called stealing a meeting, right? Mm -hmm. And that our, our ancestors in the, wake of the Civil War, uh, built the public school system across the South uh, that mm -hmm. had black and white children in integrated schools in the 1860s before Jim Crow shut shut it down. And, and you know, our ancestors fought for the, 
the freedom schools and the Panther schools. And that's the inspiration I draw on. And lastly, I would just conclude by agreeing with Marche that, that looking to students today is a place where I really draw my inspiration from. And if you're down, go and talk to some of the youth who helped to design one of the greatest lesson plans in U.S. history, which was taking the streets in the wake of the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and all the rest and transform the discussion across this country. And I just want to end with the words of one of the students in our book, uh, Israel Presley. He was a student in my world history class and in my ethnic studies class. And he is one of the leaders of the Black Lives Matter at School Movement in Seattle. And he said this, during the week of action, I learned that blackness could be part of every subject in school. I was finally being taught things about myself. I learned about black contributions to science and science class. I had a math teacher at Garfield who did excellent work, Miss Din. She didn't use math to talk about the negative statistics about black people. No, she used math to talk about the possibilities that we could achieve. I felt, it felt very powerful. Black Lives Matter at school has shown us that our community can organize a fight and come together to celebrate ourselves and our accomplishments. We're no longer living in a history of defeat. We're living in a future of success. Wow. Thank you so much for that and for leaving us off with that powerful quote. This has been an amazing conversation. I hope everybody watching at home has gotten some inspiration, some new perspectives, some ideas. I hope you all check out this book, Black Lives Matter at School, an uprising for educational justice. Uh, thank you to Haymarket Books for publishing this book and for hosting this forum. Thank you to all of our speakers, Opal Tometi, Jesse Hagopian, Denisha Jones, and uh, Marche Doss. Thank you so much, and uh, we'll see you next time. See you in the movement. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian.